All right, well, welcome back everybody to week two of the deep dive of Genesis chapters one through 11. If you remember uh, from last week, this is supposed to supplement uh, what we're doing in our small group ministry right now, but really all this is, is, is we're looking a little bit deeper into some of the text of the first 11 chapters of the Bible. So if you are not in a small group, or um, you just come across this video and you're interested in this in this story or this part of the biblical story, uh, feel free to, to, to stick around. Um, this is really, really interesting stuff. Uh, like we talked about last week, Genesis 1 through 11 sets the scene for the rest of the Bible. So everything else that you read in the Bible um, is related to or linked to or solving something that happens in the first 11 chapters uh, of, of the entire Bible. So in terms of understanding your Bible and understanding the biblical story, this is one of the most important things that you could possibly focus on and really make sure that you internalize. And so um, today we're going to be going over uh, Genesis 4 through 9, which is uh, Cain and Abel and uh, the flood and then the, the covenant that God makes with Noah. Um, and this is a really, this is a really important piece. If, if you remember where we left off last time, after 1 through 3, we, we kind of came to the understanding that uh, Genesis 1 is God's beautiful creation of the world. And the way that God creates the world is that he takes a world that is dark and chaotic and empty, tohu vavohu, tohu meaning, uh, the Hebrew word meaning um, disordered or wild, and vohu, meaning, uh, which is the Hebrew word that means empty. And so you look at the creation story, and you look at what God is actually doing in the creation story, and he is addressing the tohu by organizing disorder, by ordering the world. You know, you see him separate the, the light from the dark and the, the sky from, from the, or the waters above from the waters below, so there's a place for humans to live. And then you see him separate the, the, the land from the waters, and all of these things he calls good because he's bringing order to the disorder. And by ordering it, life is now something that's able to flourish. And then he goes on to, to address the vohu, the emptiness. And he actually fills this new ordered world. And so uh, he puts uh, lights in the sky. He puts uh, fish in the sea. He puts birds in the sky over the sea. He puts dr uh, land animals on the dry land. And all of a sudden, this tohu vavohu, chaotic, dark, empty world where life could not flourish is now ordered and filled. And life can not only exist here, but it can actually flourish and thrive. And that's the beauty of God's creative powers in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. And then he creates human beings. And the text says that he creates human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he, he created them, male and female. He created them and he blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the, the, the heavens and over everything that walks in the dry land. And so you think about what's happening. Image is a Hebrew word, selim, which, which means idol, which means representative. You know, you, you, an idol in the Bible is something that you carve out of wood or stone, and that represents the God that you worship. And so the biblical story says that human beings, you and I, are the representatives of God in this world. It's like if this world were God's temple, his holy space, we are the representatives of him. We are the images. We are the idols of God. And then he gives us a task because he blesses the idols and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And you think about the, what God was doing in the first 25 verses and, and part of what he was doing was he was filling the earth, right? He was addressing the vohu of the tohu vavohu, the emptiness. And now he's given his human images, his representatives, his representations, the, the same task to continue to fill the earth. And then he says, subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds in the skies and over everything that creeps in the dry land. And so remember the other thing that God was doing in the first 25 verses. God was actually ordering the world. He was taking the chaos and the disorder and he was ordering it so that life could thrive. And he tells his images to not only fill it, addressing the vohu, but to also subdue it and rule it and have dominion over it, which is addressing the, the, the tohu 
the disorder. Take God's good, ordered world that's full of life and continue on with the same task. The representations of God, the, the selims, the images, now become the representatives of God. And he has delegated his authority to human beings to rule this world on his behalf and in his name, doing things in his character that, that make life flourish. And that's, that's the beautiful meaning of, of what it means to be a human. And God does all of this. And in Genesis at the end, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And God saw all that he had created, and behold, it was very good. So this world that God has created, ordered, beautiful, good, full of life and flourishing with human beings in charge of it, is very good. Now, one of the things that you have to think about is in order to rule this world the way that humans have been commissioned to rule the world in the story, um, they have to have the creative power similar to God. They have to have a power to be able to actually change the world that they touch, transformative power. And you know that this is true because you come in contact with humans all the time. And the humans that you come in contact with, when they come into your space, when they come into your life, when they build a relationship with you, you change. And your reality changes. And that's because we have the power to transform. It's who we are. You don't really come in contact with another human and remain the same as you were before. Some examples that we talked about last week was, you know, you're on a, you're on a, uh, a sports team and you have this team and it has this chemistry and at the end of the year some of the players graduate and so they leave and then new players come in and the next year the team is totally different even if it's mostly the same because the transformative powers of the people that left and the people that came in are powerful enough that it really can change things and it really does change things and that's what it means to be a human we interact with this world and we have the ability to transform it in our calling, our commission, our vocation as images of God is to actually take God's good world, rule it on his behalf and make it even better, even more life. Take the garden and cover the globe with it. And everything is very good. And Genesis chapter 2 was, was another version of the creation story. And one of the things that it focuses on is it focuses on the tremendous responsibility that this puts upon human beings because uh, having the ability to transform the world is a serious thing. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's a serious thing to be able to move into spaces and change them forever. And one of the things that God does is he tells the humans that there's one tree that you can't eat from and it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, you will die. And we talked about last week that, that what God is doing here is this is, number one, this is the idea of who's the king. Because in, in ancient Near East, um, who has the ability to make the, the rules and make the laws? And who has the ability to break the rules and break the laws? The king. And so the question here is who's the king? Are you going to submit to the kingship of God where you are a very powerful image in this world, but, but it's on God's behalf that you rule, or are you going to be your own God, and are you going to rule according to your own definition of good and evil? Because what's good and what's evil, what's, what's good and what's bad, is very important when you have the power in your soul and in your bones and the energies to actually transform the world. It's very important to understand, you know, by whose definition? Who's defining what you do that's good and who's defining what you do that's bad? And so when the humans eat the fruit of the tree, they A, rebel against God because they're saying, actually, we're the king and we're going to rule the world on our own behalf. And B, they're deciding that they're going to be the ones that decide what's good and what's evil, what's good and what's bad. And they'll rule the world accordingly. And immediately... Um, upon eating the, the, the fruit. Remember they were tempted by this weird snake that was craftier than all of the other animals and, and he, he was kind of twisting God's words and he got Eve and Adam to eat the fruit off the tree. And um, as soon as this happens, this is called the fall in Genesis 3, 
uh, it results in, in the exact opposite of what God had intended, which was order, beauty, goodness, and life. It, it results in disorder, chaos, and death. And it's like the ground is cursed. Remember, the serpent is cursed first, but then the ground is cursed, and the male and female, their lives are going to be much harder trying to, to rule this world now that this has happened. Um, there's relational strife between the male and the female. Remember, they start to blame each other. Um, shame enters the world. They're afraid to be in front of God because of what they've done. They're afraid to be vulnerable, naked in front of each other because of what's happened. And ultimately, death is introduced into the world. The tree of life, which symbolizes immortality, um, that was a gift of God to these images, has been taken away and they're banished from the garden. They go east of the garden of Eden at the end of Genesis chapter 3. And so the question going into today is, well, what happens when humans rule the world on their own behalf? Like, let's say that Adam and Eve have offspring, and then these offspring go on to build cities, and then these cities reproduce, and you start to build this world and these structures and these systems. What happens when a bunch of humans are ruling the world on their own behalf? When when a bunch of humans are ruling the world according to what they believe is good and evil rather than God's definition, when they're ruling the world according to themselves rather than the character of God. And the answer to that question is that tragedy occurs. You know, like real um, destruction and tragedy. And so Genesis 4 through 9 is something kind of that, that I'll refer to as the spiral of depravity because it just keeps going worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, worse consequences are introduced. More tragedy is introduced. And so we pick up the, the text in Genesis chapter 4. And so the, they've been banished east of the garden and, and Adam and Eve have sons named Cain and Abel. Cain is the oldest son. Abel is the, the, the younger son. And uh, Cain and Abel are sacrificing to God. And um, it seems like in the text, God chooses the younger brother, Abel, which is actually very shocking according to ancient Near Eastern traditions because there was something called uh, primogenitor, which is the idea that the oldest son um, is the favored son and he's the one that's really responsible for carrying on the line and so he gets double the inheritance he gets favorable treatment and the younger son is oftentimes neglected in that way as part of it was part of that culture very very common in ancient cultures and yet god chooses abel and that's a really interesting detail because as you go on in the story you start to notice a theme of God continuing to choose the younger son, of kind of taking the way that the systems are structured and flipping them upside down, taking what's right and wrong according to the world in terms of custom and flipping it upside down. And so he chooses Jacob, the younger son, over Esau. And he chooses Joseph, the younger brother, over all of his, all, all 11 of his other brothers. And he chooses um, David, who is, who is a young, irrelevant member of, of his clan over all of his, I think, seven other brothers. And God keeps choosing the younger son. And, and this is kind of where this theme gets started. Um, and so God chooses the offering of Abel, or, or the Hebrew is he looks upon Abel's offering and he doesn't look upon Cain's. He doesn't show favor to Cain's. And Cain starts to get angry. And it says his countenance falls. He, he shows his anger in his face. And God says something very interesting to him. Um, he says uh, in, in 4, uh, verse 6, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And this is the first time that this idea of sin, or at least the word sin, is introduced in the Bible. And the Hebrew word of sin is kata, kata. And sometimes people say that, that sin means like to miss the mark. It's an archery term. Um, in, in Greek, it's hamartia. And that's true. But if you think about missing the mark, um, and you think about 
that in terms of archery, like you're, you're attempting to do something very specific. And if you kata or sin or miss, you have failed to accomplish your purpose. You have failed to accomplish your purpose. That is, that is the understanding of sin or chata in the Bible. And so there's this moment where Cain gets angry and God says, this is a decision that you're about to make. And the potential for you to fail to be a proper human being, the ability, the potential for you to fail to be an image of God the way that I've created the world, to take your divinely given vocation and rule the world uh, on God's behalf, um, the ability to fail to do that is crouching at the door. You can have mastery over it, but it wants to destroy you. And you think about our day-to-day -day lives, and you think about the decisions that we come up to every day, and this is why these stories are just so palpable and so powerful, because doesn't it feel like that sometimes? That that you come up against these moments and a lot of times for some reason we have we know what we're supposed to do we know what we ought to do we know what the good thing to do is and we fail to do that and that is shown here this idea of chata of sin and Abel succumbs to the sin and uh, he fails to be a proper human being and he murders his his younger brother and it's the first time that violence is introduced into the Bible and it's brother against brother violence and it's in cold blood and it's a tragic story. Um, and God finds Cain and he says, where's your brother? And he says, what, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's guardian? And that's an interesting response because um, to be someone's guardian or keeper means are you responsible for their life? And ironically, Cain is responsible for his brother's life. He killed him. He's responsible for taking his life. Am I my brother's keeper? And I heard a, a, a rabbinical teacher say that the whole rest of the Old Testament is an affirmative answer to that question. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Are we responsible for those around us? And the answer is, is yes. And God says, well, what have you done? And he says that your, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. And it's this like really powerful moment. And God punishes Cain even further and casts him east of where even Adam and Eve were cast. So it seems like Adam and Eve were cast east of the Garden of Eden. And then Cain is cast east of Eden, even further from the presence of God. You're created to be in intimate communion with God in this sin that seems to now have a hold of us, that's crouching at the door, that's deceiving us, that is ready to take over our lives, has the ability to get in between us and God, and there's this outward movement further and further away from the presence of God. And so he's cast east of Eden, but not before God protects him. Because remember, in Genesis chapter 3, the, the humans face consequences but in the, in the midst of those consequences, God promises deliverance. You know, the Genesis 3.15, the snake crusher. That one day your seed will crush this snake's head and he will bruise your heel. And so God promises deliverance as soon as sin enters the world. And then as soon as it manifests in violence, God still promises protection. And he's looking after his, his images. And Cain is cast east of, of the garden and Cain goes on to build a city. And the city that Cain builds becomes, you know, built upon the same violence and sin and kata or, or failure to be a human that Adam and Eve displayed and then that, that Cain displayed. And they build a city that's like that. So much so that the, the, I think the, the next generation, um, uh, one of his sons named, named Lamech, um, is bragging in, in verses 23 through 24 about how he's even more violent than Cain. You know, Cain um, had vengeance. Um, I'll have vengeance 77 times that. I'm even more violent than Cain. And you start to see this spiral, you know, it's snowballing. And, and one of the things 
that is most expressive of our failure to be humans, according to the biblical story, is violence. Um, it's the first outward manifestation of sin, of the fall, is, is violence against people that we're supposed to love and that we're supposed to keep and that we're supposed to protect. And now there's this city that's being built upon that very idea. Um, and this is an interesting, I think, analysis or, or, or at least something to point out about the idea of structural or systemic sin. You know, if, if sin really is affecting us and it crouches at the door and at all these moments we have the ability to choose to be proper humans, proper images, or the ability to chata and fail, if that's true. And we oftentimes seem to choose the opposite because we're defining good and evil for ourselves in a world that's not ours. Um, if that's true individually, then what happens when individuals who are like that start to build structures and start to build systems and start to build societies and start to build infrastructure? Um, isn't it only natural that that kind of sin would become uh, manifest within the, the systems and the structures that we build? If we're sinful, then the things that we build are going to have that same chata in them. And so, you know, we, we, we've been having a moment in our country where we're talking about systemic racism and we're talking about systemic, you know, patriarchy and oppression and dominance. Um, and a, a lot of times, you know, you get the sense that Christians are, are kind of skeptical that that's true. And Christians should be the least skeptical people in the world about that because it's part of the very origin story that we claim to believe that that when th this this croucher at the door, this sin is so powerful and it's so enmeshed in our lives that the things that we build are affected by it. And then those things become historical and they get built upon by more sin. And so it, it shouldn't be a wonder to us that we live in a world that needs to be rectified, that we participate in structures and systems that need to be changed. We shouldn't be skeptical about that. We should say, yeah, that jives with, with the biblical understanding of how the world ought to be and, and how it is. And so the end of, of Genesis chapter four uh, ends with, with Lamech bragging about uh, just how violent he is and how powerful he is and how good at shedding blood he is, just like Cain, except better. Um, and Genesis chapter five is genealogies and genealogies really are important in the Bible. So, so it's not to say they're not important, but they don't necessarily move the, the narrative along. And today, we're mostly focused on the narrative. And so we get to Genesis chapter 6. And there's a very strange section at the beginning that kind of a lot of times hijacks this in the same way that the creation debate hijacks Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so I want to address this here and just kind of tell you like what the ideas are and where that comes from. But then I want to focus on the theology. And I want to focus on the narrative and the story. Um, in the, the beginning of Genesis 6, uh, it said that the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took them as their wives. Um, and God gets angry and, he, and these people, these beings are called the Nephilim. And they were on the earth in those days and the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. And these mighty men, uh, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. That's what it says. And oftentimes... There's, there's, a, there's a big scholarly debate about what this means. And the debate is really two options. Some people believe that these were angelic beings, the sons of God, who came to earth and reproduced with women and created these kind of like hybrid offspring, which was absolutely a common thing in, in ancient mythology. So it wouldn't necessarily be surprising. Um, and the reason that's a problem according to the story, is because that's, that's a violation of the order that God has created. Remember, the goodness of the world is predicated upon order. And the, the, the angelic beings are not supposed to mingle with the humans, especially in that way. And so that would be a problem. The other interpretation is that the Nephilim, because it says, you know, the mighty men of renown, um, is that these are, these are kings and men of military might like Lamech, who were violent, who specialize in warfare and the spilling of human blood. 
which we've seen in Genesis chapter 4, is a huge problem. It's a very basic manifestation of sin in the world, is violence. And so here are these men, and this interpretation would say that these are the men that are especially good at shedding the blood of other humans. So either way, God's order is being violated, and either way, there's a certain level of violence and blood that's being spilled by these beings. And so to take away from, from that and go into the rest of the story, that, that's, that's kind of what I want us all to understand, is that there's, there's um, an increasing boil of violence in the world. It was, it was Cain, and then it was Lamech, and now it's these men of renown, these mighty men, these warriors, and there's increasing of spilling of human blood in the world. And uh, it says that, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. And so God looks upon the world and he sees that it's evil in the hearts of men. He sees that chata, sin, seems to win more often than not. And that is... Uh, manifesting itself or becoming manifest in the world through violence and bloodshed and chaos and disorder and darkness and death, the very thing that God pulled beautiful ordered creation out of. It's a, it's a, the beauty of Genesis chapter 1 is being destroyed by the evil that's in our hearts, by the chata that crouches by the door and overwhelms us and destroys us. And so in terms of the narrative, that, that's where we're going. And now, it's interesting. Um, God's response to this, it, it, it doesn't say that he's angry, you know? It doesn't say that he's going to get vengeance. It says that he's grieved. He's sad. You know, the God of the Bible is the God that feels. It's not a God who's way out there in a different world, different place, you know, the, the divine watchmaker who set this all in motion and leaves. It's a God who's, who's present and personal, and he feels what we feel, and he grieves, and he has emotions, and anger is not what is displayed here. Um, it's grief, and it's regret, and he, uh, he promises to blot out man from the earth and, and, and all living things. And this is the, the story of the flood. So God chooses a remnant. He chooses Noah as the, the representative of humanity. Because remember, Adam was a representative of humanity. And now the world is going to be cleansed and uh, go underwater and come out new. And Noah is going to be the new Adam the new representative. And so Noah is chosen, but, um, but the, uh, the earth is, is flooded, and it says that the waters go up to the highest mountain, and everything dies. And so what is, what is the flood about? Like, what's happening in the flood? Um, one way to think about it is to think about cleansing. When you go on in, in the Bible, you read that blood is a particularly holy substance. And when they have a temple worship and they have sacrifices, um, there's ritual purity that the people of God have to go through in you know Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and then through the Old Testament. And one of the things that, that you have to go through ritual purity f for is if you touch blood. And that's because blood is holy. The Bible thinks that blood is your life fluids. And the reason that it thinks that is because if you cut somebody, um, they're going to bleed. And if it doesn't you know, heal, it's going to bleed and bleed and bleed until the life drains out of them. And so blood is particularly holy. And what has been happening in the last few chapters? Blood is being shed. Blood is being shed. The sons of God, the mighty men, blood is being shed. Blood is being shed on the earth. And a cleansing is happening in the flood. Another way to think about the, the flood story is a decreation story. Because remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, 
Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. And so part of the disordered, violent, chaos, uh, empty mess that, that the world was in before God started to order it and fill it was it was covered in, in chaotic waters, chaotic dark waters. And out of the chaotic dark waters came the beautiful world, including human beings. And what have humans been doing with their divine mandate to rule the world on God's behalf? Instead of taking God's good world and making it better, more order, more beauty, more goodness, they're actually taking God's good world and they are destroying it. They're bringing chaos and darkness and death into the world, the very thing that God pulled the world out of in, in Genesis chapter 1. And this becomes clear um, when you read uh, Genesis 6.12. Because Genesis 6.12 says that, um, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was ruined. Or, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupted. Um, do you remember Genesis 1.31? And God saw all that he had created, and behold, it was very good. And then there's the fall, and then there's Cain and Abel, and then there's Lamech, and then there's the sons of God, and then Nephilim, and now God saw the world, all that he had created, and behold, it was ruined. By who? By us. Because we have agency in this world, and we have the ability to transform it. And when we do it on our own behalf, rather than God's behalf, we destroy it. And according to the book and according to the way that those two sentences in Hebrew are exactly congruent, um, humans have ruined the good world that God created by Genesis chapter 6. And so back into the waters we go, right? Out of the waters we came by the grace of God, back into the waters we go in the flood. It's a decreation story. We have the ability to actually decreate um, and that goes hand in hand with violence, right? Because when you, when you commit violence against somebody, that's an act of decreation. You kill somebody, you're, you've decreated them. And we have that ability to do that to each other and to the world. And that's a responsibility that we should hold very, very um, with, with proper awe and respect. And oftentimes we don't. And the consequences is something like the flood where the earth gets back into the chaos and darkness and death. And so Noah is spared and the ark is spared. And when he comes off of the ark, he steps off as a new Adam. And you can kind of see the parallels because in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is with all the animals and he's naming the animals. And uh, in Noah's ark, you know, Noah takes all of the animals onto the ark and he's with the animals. Adam's the representative human now Noah is the representative human. Adam is told to be fruitful and multiply. And in Genesis chapter 8, uh, God tells Noah the exact same thing. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Um, Noah gets off the boat and God repeats this mandate two more times. Be fruitful and multiply. Um, 9-1, be fruitful and multiply, 9-7. And this is one of those things where the Hebrew authors, they repeat things that they want you to see. Because they want you to see that Noah is the new Adam, that, that he's gotten off the ark, and now he is supposed to do what Adam did. And God makes a, or what Adam was, he, Noah's supposed to do what Adam's supposed to do and failed at. And God makes a promise to Noah it's a very interesting promise because you've seen what's happened. I mean, it got so bad that the world was decreated. Human beings failed chata at their purpose and their vocation and their tasks so badly that the world was actually decreated. And now here's the new representative and God looks upon him and he says, um, he says that this, uh, 
I will never, 821, I will never again curse the ground because of man, because the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. So I will never again curse the ground because the intention of man's heart is evil. Now remember, the reason that the flood came was because the intention of man's heart was evil. And now God looks upon Adam, or uh, new Adam, Noah, and he says, because the intention of man's heart is evil, I'll never do what I just did again. And we usually look at that and we think, oh, that's just God's promise to not flood the world, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but it's much deeper than that theologically. God <laughs> is looking at Noah and he's saying, this isn't going to work the way that it was intended to work. Because evil is continuously on the hearts of men. And men tend to chata. And I can see what's going to happen. And it's going to happen again. And if I were going to flood the world every time that, that humans destroyed it with sin, corrupted it with sin, ruined it, then it would be this constant cycle of decreation and creation, decreation and creation, or... God would just have to get rid of humans and start a different creation project without us as his images, his vice regents, his delegated authorities. And yet the Noahic covenant, the promise to Noah, is this beautiful promise that says that because human beings have evil in their hearts, because we're corrupted by sin, I'm never going to flood the earth. And what God is saying is that God is recognizing the compromised state of humanity. And he's recognizing that humanity is not going to do the thing that it was supposed to do. That there is going to be failure, there is going to be chata, there is going to be chaos and death and violence, and, and it's not going to go the way that it's supposed to. And yet God chooses us. He chooses compromised humans over another route over another means, over another way of creation. And that's a really beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing to read. God recognizes that we're sinful. He recognizes that we're corrupted. And he chooses us anyways. And he will not go on in this creation project without us. He will not start over without us. He's chosen us. And one of the reasons that this is really interesting is because a lot of times you get questions where people ask you, you know, why doesn't God get rid of evil? Why does God allow evil? And according to the Bible, the reason that God doesn't get rid of evil is because he doesn't want to get rid of us. In order to get rid of evil, he would have to get rid of us. Evil is not something abstract to the Hebrew authors. It's something that we do. It's something that we choose. And the, the consequences are devastating and real. And so God says, this is, this is a real thing that we're going to have to deal with. But I choose you anyways. And the rest of the story is about how God redeems his image bearers rather than destroys them. Uh, and this is the, the covenant that sets that scene. This is the covenant where God chooses compromised humanity over another option. And God is faithful to his promises. Um, and so that's, re that's, really, that's really something that's interesting when you look forward. Because you're going to read some of the Old Testament. And you're going to think like, man, the, I don't understand why the humans are acting like this. Or I don't understand why God is telling them to do these things. I don't understand why it seems like violence is mixed up in the plans of God. I don't understand why things, you know, why God doesn't just snap his fingers and things happen or something goes away or something comes up. And, and one of the things that happens is that according to, to the covenant with Noah, the promise, um, God is going to accommodate to sinful humans and we're going to be his images. And he has a plan of redemption, but he's going to work through us, even in our compromised state, even in our sin, even in our imperfection. He's chosen us. Um, he's not going to go on without humans. And so some of the things that we do in the name of God are going to be flawed. And some of the things that we do in the name of God are going to be oppositional to what God actually wants. 
in this world. And God has chosen that. He said that he chooses us anyways, even though we're going to act like that. Even though the, the croucher at the door, the chata, seems to devour us often, we actually move on in this creation project as the images of God. And Noah shows immediately that he is indeed still afflicted by this sin or by this um, shortcomings. Um, and it says that he plants a vineyard, which is good because, you know, he's, he's like the new Adam. So it's like a garden. That's good. But then he gets drunk, which is probably bad. And then he gets naked, which is bad. And he's in his tent. And some, it doesn't really give details, but something shameful happens with his son in his tent. And I think the point of that story is to show that indeed God looks upon human hearts and, it, and it, they're still compromised. And Noah, his righteous representative, and his sons show it right away. As soon as the flood has subsided and they step off and they sacrifice to God and he makes a promise to them, it all goes south again. Um, and later in the Bible, you get, you get stories about compromised men who are still carrying out the will of God and they're sinning and they're, they're punished for their sin oftentimes. Uh, they ruin some of the plans that God has for them because of their sin sometimes. And yet God insists on working through them. The story of Israel is a story of um, rebellion and failure and yet they're God's people. David is a king who is a man after God's own heart, a humble king, uh, becomes a biblical model for, for a messianic figure, for, for a savior, who's going to rule the world in, in a similar way like his, his ancestor David. But David, you know, ends up committing rape and, and murder and ruins his family. Tragic. Um, God knows this. He knows that this happens to us. He knows that we choose this. He knows that we're compromised, and it all goes back to the promise to Noah. He's going to work through us anyways. And sometimes the way that he works through us is going to look imperfect, and sometimes we're going to, we're going to fumble the ball. And sometimes it's not going to go well. But God has chosen us. We are his images. We are his representatives. And there's security in that. Just like in Genesis 3.15, there's security in future redemption. In um, Genesis 8 and 9, the covenant with Noah, there's security in the fact that God has chosen us, has chosen humanity, has decided to not go a different way, and has made it clear that he's going to work through us even in our compromised state, and he's going to accommodate to us, and he's going to ultimately redeem us and restore us and set us free from this chata, from the sin. And so, the uh, chapter 9 ends with, with another genealogy and um, next week we go on to uh, Genesis 10 and 11 which is basically the Tower of Babel and then I'm going to connect some of these themes or some of these stories or examples with the rest of the Bible because what ends up happening is the authors of the rest of the Old Testament they, they kind of see the world through the lens that was created in Genesis 1 through 11, and these stories seem to repeat themselves. And sometimes the humans do better, and sometimes the humans make the same mistake. Sometimes they do worse. Sometimes God's chosen people act exactly like Adam and Eve, and exactly like Cain, and exactly like Lamech, and exactly like Noah, and sometimes they, they fix some of that, and sometimes some of that is redeemed. But the rest of the story is about how God is going to work through people to redeem people and bring them back into his presence like we were always supposed to be in Eden, in paradise. And uh, it's a beautiful story. And so we will uh, see you guys next week. We talk about the, the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babylon. And as we trace some of these themes into the rest of the Bible, I hope this was helpful. I hope this was informative. And we will see you guys again in a couple weeks. All right.